Well, guys, this is Rebecca Farmer. You might remember her last year. She was on the show and we talked all about her incredible health journey overcoming 20 plus diseases. And now is this ravishing young lady that you see here today on the screen. We're not going to talk about health stuff today. Well, indirectly, we might uh, directly. We're going to talk about something that I think is something that's not talked about nearly enough. And you went through this yourself. And I really want you to be vulnerable and raw as you want to be, because I know this is a tough subject, but I also know it's something that's on your heart. And it you went through a very difficult relationship in a domestic abuse type of situation in the midst of you being sick. Like, I remember seeing all those pictures and you would always write on your page, which by the way, tailored keto health is who she is over on Instagram. But you would post these pictures and you would show like a before like that. And well, that's when I was going through the narcissistic abusive relationship. And I'm like, my God, like, do you think it contributed to some of your health problems? Absolutely. Definitely. Um, I mean, it, it kept me the environment, this most recent situation, the environment, it was impossible to heal in. And I already dealt with environmental issues, you know, with my parents when they were accusing me of having an eating disorder. That yeah. dynamic was horrible. I mean, I was constantly in a state of fight or flight, but then I, I got out only to move back in into a worse situation. I mean, this was scary. I was I couldn't work. I didn't have any money. And this guy was manipulating me. And it was, you know, I didn't realize how bad it was until people told me. So, yeah, I remember when you were on last year, you talked about the the whole putting you in a clinic for an eating disorder. And I mean, like that messed with your head. And, and you know, I talk a lot about trauma on my One Step Deeper podcast with Brittany. And we talk about how trauma begets trauma begets trauma. And it kind of lead you down these paths of making choices that are a trauma response. So do you think maybe right. you didn't see all the warning signs of this recent event because your trauma triggers kind of led you in that direction? Yes. Wow. That is some good insight, like right off the bat. Um, I think that I was drawn to things that were harmful for me. Um, and I also think that in a way it was sort of like trauma bonding, which is a thing that I was not familiar with until after I went through it. And it was like, oh my gosh, I'm drawn to this person yes. for his own brokenness, yes. for all of these, you know, we think that we love someone for all of their weaknesses and, you know, exactly the, just the way you are. But there is trauma bonding is, there's a blurry line between the two. And, um, yeah, so I, I do think that everything that I went through, it was my place of comfort, and I didn't even know what love should look like. I didn't even know, you know, the way that I viewed myself had to be dramatically changed. I had to learn to identify with Christ, and until that changes, we're just going to, we we accept the love that we think we deserve. Um, that is very, very true. Well, and think about the love you were exemplified as a kid. They they pretty much had contempt for you, Rebecca. So that made you learn to have contempt for yourself so that when this new person comes in, if you didn't have contempt from him, you almost didn't feel love. It's so perverted when you like think this through of you only replicate and desire the things that were mimicked to you. And so if you didn't have loving, kind parents, why would you choose a loving, kind partner to be with? And so it's in a weird way, you chose the love that was inevitable for you, but was the exact wrong thing for you. You know, I want to say it's not all my parents were very loving and kind growing oh. up, um, truly. But what I went through with the whole eating disorder situation, it got very ugly. Yes. And to the point where we were no longer talking. Um, and that was very ugly. Yes. And there was not a lot of love there. But growing up, they did show me a lot of love. And it was my own decisions. I got into relationships. I was always trying to do missionary dating. You know, I would go for the broken people yeah. and try to fix them. And I put up with a lot of crap. I was cheated on multiple times. I was, you know, I was putting myself in that situation. And it just got worse and worse over the years. So... I never really was in a, 
I mean, I was in a good relationship right before we broke it up when I got sick. And that was that was it. So that fell apart. Um, so, yeah, I never had a really good experience with that. That's all that I knew. So one of the goals here today that I think we both have a heart for is helping women especially, but some guys as well, kind of recognize some of the signs that you're in a destructive kind of relationship or, and this could be a relationship of any kind, not just romantic. It could be friendship. It could be family. There's all these signs show up in literally every relationship, guys. And so uh, one of the things that you and I have, and we're really good friends, by the way, just full disclosure. I know her well. She knows me well. And and we talk often. And I said something recently that you're like, trigger, trigger, uh, wrong, no. And I was like, whoa, teach me, like, what did I do? And it was just one of those moments where I went, oh my gosh, like I never realized that could be something that could be problematic. We smoothed it over and we're cool now, but it it needed to be addressed. So can we get into some of those things? Just go start wherever you want to start. Yeah. Um, I mean, so when someone has a boundary, First of all, my boundaries are not apparent to everyone. And I know, I'm aware that I have triggers that are, you know, they're triggers. Not everyone should expect them to be a trigger. So I think that it's important for you to make your boundaries known. And just like I did with you, you received it very well. But if someone is unwilling to receive it and they get very defensive, that's the perfect situation where you're learning who to hold on to and who to let go of. Not necess- it wouldn't have made you a bad person if you were not able to receive it. So we don't have to, you know, we don't have to say you know, those people are bad people if they can't understand. Um, like my mom living with my parents with the whole eating disorder situation. Uh, my mom would watch me like a hawk in the kitchen and she would, you know, ask, you know, are you eating enough or just even just watching me cook my food? It was such a trigger. It was so stressful. And I couldn't say to her, please stop, you know, Um, and that made it really ugly. She was unable to receive it. And the fact that it was a trigger to me inevitably, inevitably meant that I did have an eating disorder. It doesn't work that way. Triggers happen because of what we go through. Um, So anyways, I guess I'm going all over the place with this, but we just... It's not an easy topic to just go head first into because there's so many nuances, even to what you were just saying. There's so many like angles to that. And then what that how that applies to a friendship, how that applies to a love relationship, how that applies. Yes. to a, Like it's not easy. So it's going to be jagged today, guys. Just it's going to be OK. Just stick with us. This will yeah. Be good. Yeah. I mean, respect and love is of the utmost importance. Yeah. And that's, I think, trust is also. Um, so if someone is telling you that they have a boundary and you're unable to respect it or trust them, um, if you feel personally offended, then maybe you should take a step back and, and ask yourself, what does this relationship really mean to me? Because if you aren't able to separate yourself, um, you know, like there's a there's a guy that I that I liked and you know, he needed space. And it's like, this doesn't have to do with me. Like I took it really personally when, when he disappeared. And when we reconnected, I was like, man, you disappeared for that long period of time. And I got really depressed and I thought it all had to do with me. And he was like, no, it had nothing to do with you. Like we can't always take things so personally. Um, and if you really want to love someone, you got to respect their boundaries. And when you do that, they'll let you in because you're a safe person for them to be themselves around. Like if you love someone, you want them to heal. You want them to be free to be whoever they are and work through their issues. So for you, Jimmy, I had that red flag. And I, it's a blessing to me that I felt comfortable to tell you this is a red flag for me. And you just, you received it so well. And that's very rare. Thank you. And I was shocked. So it was, Cause I was like, I would never do anything to hurt you. And then when you said red flag, I went, oh, teach me, what did I do? <laughs> like, and you did. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I never realized that that was a tendency before. And this brings up something you were just talking about. That This is a good point. We all have different personality types, like, and we're guided by that. Um, 
I don't know if you've done, ever done your Enneagram or if you believe in Enneagrams. And yeah. like, I'm a three. My best friend is a one. Brittany is a one. And so we kind of clash sometimes with the, the different personality types because she's the kind that when she's upset, she wants to be secluded. I'm upset. I want to talk. And so it's like, OK, we can't like um, commiserate. And I was the same way as you were with this person that you liked. Um, you wanted to know what did you do wrong? And he's like, oh, no, I just need to be by myself. He, so he was the Britney in that case. And you were like, yeah. oh, what did I do? And so yeah. this is another dynamic that comes into this is different personalities are going to respond in different exactly. ways. Yeah, I get in my own way sometimes. You know, I'm a health and life coach. I want to help people. And Sometimes I get upset when I feel like someone is just stuck in a place where they have to work through it. And I've gotten a lot better. But when I first started, it was really hard for me, like, to go on and enjoy the rest of my day. It would really, really sack me. And now it's like, this is the process. And it's a beautiful thing. And I'm going to be with you through it, even when it's hard and ugly. Um, but it was almost like I wanted instant gratification. It's like, no, I know you can do this, but yes. it doesn't work that way. And that's my personality. Um, so it's it comes from a good motive. Um, you know, my heart is in the right place, but being aware of different personality types, for sure, definitely. And that's something that anyone should be aware of when you get into a relationship. And so um, when it becomes harmful, like in this this um, narcissistic relationship that I was in recently is when a, a sign of that is when they're beating you up for having a different personality. Yeah. When you are sensitive to certain things and they're saying, well, it, that's not legitimate. You know, they're, they're not validating your feelings. Your feelings are true. Perception is reality. Yeah. And if someone can't honor that, then they've got to go. It's so funny you bring that up because I was just talking to a friend that lives in the UK today and she was uh, with this guy for a couple weeks. And the first week he was like awesome and everything. Oh, my gosh. They got together. They hooked up all the things. And then suddenly he showed his true colors. Narcissistic through and through uh, was just berating her in the text for whatever. Um, and finally, she's like, I think we need to stop texting. And then he goes ballistic on her and sends a whole bunch more tags. And finally, she's just like, like, I can't handle that. That's I don't deserve that. I'm like, but there's a lot of people that they're like so desperate for a relationship that they would put up with that kind of thing. And, you know, you stayed in a relationship for a little while longer than you needed to. What do you think kept you and yours kept you bonded? Was it the fear that? oh, I'm underweight, I'm sick, nobody would want me, and so therefore I feel like I have to cling to this guy even though he's a total asshole to me? No, it was more like um, I believed the crap he was saying about me. Ah, the gaslighting. Because I was sick, and because even though I told him, I gave him full disclosure when we met. I said, I'm sick, I'm likely not going to live for much longer, I'm struggling. I need to eat only meat. I'm struggling with binge eating. Like I told him all of that. And I told him I need to see a chiropractor every day. I'm, I need medical massage and it costs a lot, but that's how I stayed out of an emergency room all the time. Like, um, so when I moved in with him and I was doing all the things I promised that I needed to do. And he said, I understand he turned into a different person. It was not okay. And he said, you know, you're making up your autoimmune issues. I demand to speak with all your doctors. I got him on the phone with my doctors. You know, it didn't matter. He would go behind my back and talk with my aunt and say, she just has an eating disorder. He manipulated my own parents against me. Um, it was really twisted. And I, I quickly felt suffocated and that's that's when I realized I've got to get away from him. But in the beginning, it was more like I gave him grace because I understood how frustrating and annoying it would be to be with someone like me. Even though I was honest with him about it, I don't think he no one could have realized what they were getting themselves into. And it was irresponsible of me to ask for a relationship at that time. I was not ready to love someone 
I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't realize that was not the way that God intends and that's not the way anyone should do it. But that's the situation we got into and it was really ugly. And um, so, yeah, it took me a while to even really realize it doesn't work that way. And um, yeah. And it sounds like the gaslighting started quickly. And this is a term, if you haven't heard it, guys, look it up. We're going to talk about it a little bit here, but basically blaming you for all the everything and there's no culpability with that person doing the blaming. That is a huge warning sign, you guys. If somebody right. does wrong and you do all the wrong, there's so many women out there, especially Rebecca, they take on all that guilt and shame, just like you did. Believe hey, the gaslighting until you kind of wake up and go, well, wait a minute. I'm not doing all of these things. This guy never takes responsibility. It's usually the guy. It can work the other way around, but it's usually the guy. Um, what's going on? And so good thing that you did wake up and you saw that before it got worse, whatever worse would have been. Yeah. And it was a very twisted form of gaslighting where he would basically, um, it's like he would pretend to be sympathetic with the situation. And he would ask me, you know, what are some ways that I can better support you? But in that, he was actually blaming me for things that weren't even my fault. He's like, what are some ways that we can make this work for us because you're screwing it all up? And it was like, you're creating things that don't even exist. Um, you know, we started seeing, I asked him to see a Christian counselor with me. Yeah. And even in those sessions, it was really twisted. And when he would leave the room, she was like, it doesn't look like this is going to go anywhere because he was, it was impossible for him to see his own faults. Um, and that's what was very, very scary. And I didn't even see that for way longer than I should have been there. So do you think this whole journey is all about seeking worth like I think sometimes we seek self-worth in other people don't yeah. seek in self like self-worth it's literally in the title guys you try to do it yourself and work on yourself I've done a lot of this kind of work myself the past couple of years um, and I know you've been working on yourself uh, when was that relationship by the way how long ago was that that was in May 2019 so we're only talking less than two years ago you guys that you were in this relationship um and thankfully got out of it. Like, what were some of those other signs that you saw that this was not going somewhere and it was not feeding you and not letting you properly heal physically? Physically, uh, I had no peace. Um, my blood sugars were all over the place. I was neat. Like I said, I needed massage on a regular basis more than I needed before I moved in with him. And it was simply just to get my central nervous system into a place where I wasn't like <gasps> constantly, I, I, my digestion was way worse. Um, you know, every time I ate, it was around him and he was constantly judging me and, um, my impulse, you know, the binge eating got way worse. I mean, I was struggling before I moved in with him and I thought that moving in with him would give me more accountability. I told him I need, I want to do all meat. I know that it's going to help. Um, and it just got way worse. He started accusing me of having an eating disorder because of that. He said he was keto. And then when I got there, he had all this crap food and like everything he said was untrue. Um, but yeah, just being in that space and then having him accuse me of binge eating made me way worse. And to the point where I would, he, um, you know, I would break into his food and have like a bunch of rice and things that I don't even crave. It was like, what is going on? It was yeah. so messed up. And it was simply my body telling me, you have to get out of this prison. Like I was, it was an escape. I was sabotaging at one point. And um, that's when I decided in my head, I'm going to check myself into an emergency room and ask them to treat me for an eating disorder because that's what it has become. And I clearly cannot refeed myself in this environment with this guy. I would rather be held in an eating disorder unit and go through all that again than be stuck with this guy. You know, um, I couldn't take care of myself there. It was it was horrendous. And I was I was tiptoeing everywhere. I would lock my door at night. Um, it was creepy. 
It was hard. I couldn't imagine, Rebecca. Now, keep in mind, you guys, you were made to go into an eating disorder clinic as a teenager by your parents. So the fact that you an made. Adult. What's that? I mean, I was an adult still. Not oh. to interrupt you. Yeah. Oh. Thank, thank you. So the, all the more you had this traumatic experience being forced into it before. Now, here you are doing it again. Like it was that bad. Was that the moment Rebecca said, huh, I need to do something different. I have to get away. That was the moment. Pretty much. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was in my spirit for a long time, but that was the moment that I realized there I cannot continue here. And I was. I mean, just to get out of there was a miracle by the grace of God. And I knocked on my neighbor's, neighbor's door. It's just crazy that I'm going public with all this right now. It's very emotional. But um, I would, so I would go for a walk every morning before I ate, um, basically to get away from him, but also just to get some fresh air. And I started knocking on my neighbor's doors, people I didn't know. And just telling them, look, I am stuck with this guy and I need somewhere to live and I'm sick. I need some help. I, I was living in a very um, wealthy area. So I knew these people, these people had servants quarters. Um, so I was just looking for someone who would help me out. Um, I got the police involved at one point and he just, he just laughed at it. He continued. Um, but yeah, it got really bad. And for months, I was looking for a place just to go. I, I was considering living out of my car for a long time. I was calling Catholic Charities, um, the 211 number, where they basically, they hook you up. They're supposed to help you. Um, multiple women's shelters, they were packed. They didn't have space for me. I would have lived in a women's shelter. Um, my chiropractor knew about all this, and he would constantly tell me, you've got to get out of that environment. Yes, because he would feel he would feel the difference, you know, from a day that we had a conversation or a day that I was able to escape him. And um, and he we talk about it still. He's like, it's insane how much better you are responding to everything. My body took off when I got into a better environment right away, even when I was doing the same things, when I didn't change my you know, I did carnivore. I started yeah. it with him in that house. But when I got out of that environment, um, a lot of things got a lot better. And that's when my intuition was really able to take off. And um, it just it increased the healing increased so much when I got out of there. And that is such a key point. You guys watching and listening to this, if you're in that sympathetic state, like on, in a constant way, your body, no matter how good you eat, no matter how carnivore, no matter how keto, no matter how much real food, no matter how much exercise, all of that's going to be negated by the stress of your life. So it may not be domestic violence like you dealt with. It could just it could be like a boss at work that yells at you every day. It just could be just broken relationships. It doesn't have to be something dramatic. Like think about right things and how powerful that is but even more so when you're in intense and in a abu domestic abuse type of situation if you don't flee that situation you can't hope to heal right yeah and i was aware of that even before i got into this situation but i was under the impression that he was this guy that was ready to take on all my issues and that he knew that was an issue for me you know, um, he knew that I had issues with my parents and I told him what my triggers were and he abused the heck out of it. Do you think he saw weakness in your sickness and thought he could take advantage of you? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. That's what my my butcher friend told me. She was the first person to say, you have to get out of there because I told her what was happening. And she's like, he's literally preying on you like a hurt animal. Um, and that was the first time I was like, wow, I never looked at it that way. I mean, I think from when he saw my profile in eHarmony, that might have clicked with him. You know, this girl is clearly struggling. This girl clearly needs to be dependent on someone. 
and he saw an opportunity to take advantage, whether or not it was intentional on his behalf. You know, I, I don't think that he knows how to love yet for his own personal reasons, but I was in the same place and maybe he was drawn to me because of that too. The same reasons I was drawn to him, you know, like I want to believe the best for him. I know that he's sorry that it was so ugly too. It's not like he like was intentional about it, but I think that's why he was drawn to me and that's what it turned into. And knowing you the way that I, I know you now, you, you're one of the kindest hearted people I've ever met. And I know that you always try to see that good in everyone. And, and I try to be the same way in my own life. And it's yeah. like, it makes you a sitting target for people because they're like, oh, yeah. I can take advantage of that kindness because they'll put up with more than most people do. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that contributed some as well? Yes. I set myself up for it. I was asking for it. Um, and I, I did for a long time by continuing to make excuses for him and um, just letting him get away with these behaviors because I felt like I can't fight back. Like I was living under his roof, you know? Um, so that made it really hard for me to fight back. And I started to, that's why I started the counseling. Cause I, I was like, I need someone to help me stand up for myself and work this out. Um, but the more that I just, just delved into this whole situation, the more I, I realized this is a huge red flag and that itself made me scary. Actually, I'm feeling like I'm feeling anxious talking about this. I haven't gotten into it like this and I feel my body, um, just, it feels like I'm getting electrocuted almost. It's like, oh my gosh, I have to do something about this. Um, oh environment 100 percent you're you're in a safe place here you were the friend <laughs> thank you so and thank you for being so vulnerable because this is going to help so many people rebecca when you and i were talking about this i said are you sure you want to go there because i knew it would be emotional and, and i've had yeah. moments in my life like that yeah we'll cry it all out get it all out girl <laughs> <laughs> it's so good and writing my book it's it i have to take my time i know we've talked about this but um, again, saying it out loud is, this is a way to deal with trauma. So I appreciate the opportunity is just going through it again. And it makes me all the more grateful for where I'm at. It's not too long later. It's amazing how God has just transformed this entire situation. Um, I, I was so desperate. I was so scared. And, um, whoever is going through something like that, where they, if, if you feel stuck, in your environment, there's always hope, okay? I was knocking on my neighbor's doorsteps. <laughs> like, you have to fight for yourself. And if you feel like you're in a relationship where it's like, well, I don't know if I'll find anyone else. There is someone for everyone, I promise you. Um, but God does not desire that for anyone. And I'm just, I'm glad that we can have this conversation because there are so many people who settle and um, they don't live up to their full potential. And it's because they're with someone or they're in an environment that's holding them back. And see, I look at you today and you are just this resounding symbol to me of kind of grace and compassion for other people, like all the things I think that you have always wanted. And it's such a testament to who you are as an individual. Um, and I think it's even more over the top because of the things you've been through between your parents and that cold relationship that you had in your early 20s. And then this relationship with a narcissist that was making you feel bad. I think you've almost gone the opposite direction just to say, you know what? I want that stuff to be in my past that I'm gonna represent myself this way now, and it makes you so attractive as a friend and some potential mate for someone down the road. Like, and, and I also know you very well, you're very guarded with that as well. You don't let mm -hmm. people into your life, which is why I'm like, oh, thank you that I'm in her life. Um, you don't easily do that, because I know because of the hurt, you, you kind of had to build some walls while still having that heart for people. It's a tricky balance what you do. Yes, it is. It's definitely harder with men. 
um, because I'm, you know, it's natural for men to be drawn to women and there's a blurry line. It's like, I want to be friends with you, but now I know I don't want to take advantage of anyone. And I, I've had people reach out to me for health coaching or life coaching. And then they admit to me, you know, honestly, I just wanted to talk to you on the phone. <laughs> and it's like, that's kind of offensive to me. Um, you should just be up front and forward. So it is, there's a blurry line, but I don't even, I don't waste time with it. And I'm just, I've learned that it's not rude to be forward and say, Hey, look, if there is any romantic interest here, I'm not interested. And I used to be really afraid to do that. It's like, does this make me sound cocky? Is this going to offend them? But it's like, that's what I need to do to have peace about it. And if, if you take it offensively, then I'm sorry. Well, you know, what you've been through, I think that's a fair boundary to set with people. If you're not ready for something like that, they need to respect that boundary. Like you were saying at the very beginning, you set boundaries and people step over them. You're like, all right, I warned you. My boundary line is right, right. here. So, you know, right. what do at well, that point? Yeah. Well, I, I think what you've overcome is amazing. And you're just a shining example of no matter what you've been through, you can overcome. And that's, that's talking about your physical stuff. Overcome 20 diseases, guys, like plus diseases. Like you are just amazing in that way. I reference you a lot when people say, well, I'm underweight and I'm very sick. I don't, I don't think there's any way I can heal. I'm like, let me introduce you to my friend. Rebecca. <laughs> like I literally just did that the other day on Clubhouse and they're like, oh, who's that? So I'm like, go look her up, Taylor Keto Health over on Instagram. Um, but now like this side of you that you, you, you don't really show this side of you publicly too often. You'll reference it, domestic violence, and, and just it just goes from there. But I, I really appreciate you opening up here. What, what else have we not addressed with this issue that you wanted to talk about here today? No, I'm not really sure. I think, um, you know, we've encouraged people to get out of that situation. But I also want to be clear that there are steps to take. They have hotlines. And I was really resistant to doing that. So it's like, man, that really makes this real if I call a hotline, you know, but that's exactly what it is. It's real. And they're not going to sit there and be like, you have to flee your home or, you know, um, just tell someone, tell someone, start talking about it and don't keep it to yourself. And um, yeah, I just want, I want people to really learn that. You've got to learn self-worth. You know, you hit the nail on the head is I was constantly giving people this grace that I always wanted for myself. And now I understand I deserve that. I deserve to be loved the way that I love other people, the way that I know God calls me to love other people. Yes. And the, it did not. I couldn't do it until I gave it to myself. And that was really hard. I didn't want to love myself that way. And it's like I had to accept that God's grace was sufficient. I had to let go of control. Um, it was like a very OCD thing. Um, and I kept trying to get that love by giving it to other people. But it doesn't work that way. You don't get it that way. You can't. That was another thing with this relationship is he would try to show me that he cared about me. But in his own way. He was always very selective with, I'm going to show you how I love you by doing this or by doing that. But there were things that I didn't even want him to do. And he wasn't listening to my needs. Yes. It was how he wanted it to play out. And he just would think, so I deserve this because I did that. And I, in a way, I was doing the same thing. Um, you know, I was showing him for forgiveness and selfless, trying to be selfless love, but it's like I was expecting him to excuse my behavior in return. I was expecting him to enable my behavior in return. And that's unhealthy for both of us. So, um, yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with that. And I think this issue of communication, like had you articulated, OK, this is what I need if you can do these things. And then he had articulated, OK, I'm willing to do these things, you know, and this is what I need. Da, da, da. Like, I think that's where a lot of these 
issues break down is there's no communication. There's assumptions of what you need. When he defined the terms of I'm showing you love and you're like, well, that's nothing that I would want. But in his eyes, that was the definition in his eyes that he was loving. It gets so convoluted if you stop and think about yes. how like and it all comes back to we got to talk to each other. Right, right. And talk and really get to know the person. So yeah. like one thing was he he agreed. He was like, um, I'm going to massage your back at night so that you don't have to go to as many massages and stuff. And in return, he expected me to, you know, like right off the bat, be more capable of doing things with him. And even at one point, he was like, I need physical affection. And this was at the time where, you know, he was yelling at me every day. And it's like, I'm sorry, but I can't muster up feelings to be physically affectionate of you. And thank God I slept in a separate bedroom like the entire time. All we did was kiss, but he still wanted that. And I was like, I don't even want to look at you. And he, what was so twisted to me is that he still desired it. Even after I told him I'm not physically attracted to you, he still wanted it. And that was like, that's so messed up. There it is. It was, that was the first sign, probably the first big sign of the narcissism. It was yeah. like, I need to be pleasured. And it's your duty to pleasure me because I rubbed your back a little bit. Like it, he literally made that bargain in his head. Well, because I did that, you, I deserve not, don't you love me? Don't you yeah. want to? And it didn't come across that way. It didn't come across as him saying, um, you know, I did this, so you owe me that. Of course, he's not going to say it that way. This is a warning to other people. He made it seem like, you know, it's normal of him to to expect that. He's like, this is how I'm created. This is my love language. And so I need that right now. That's what I need from you. He said it in a very tender way, but it's still just as twisted because he's not listening to me. He's not listening to the fact that I am not attracted to you. That makes me sick. I can't do that. And he still wanted that physical connection when there was a disconnect to the point where I couldn't give it. And that's disregarding the other person. That's disregarding my boundary. And that's not love. That's not how it functions. And the disconnect too was when he was yelling at you, not realizing that's the antithesis of what you're now asking her to do. Right. Love you're not feeling loved in the midst of the yelling. And so it's like, right. okay, stop the yelling and maybe I'll have an inclination to want to be loving and tender. Yes, exactly. I would try. It was sad how often I would try. I was like, I think the one time I kind of wanted to kiss him was when we read the Bible together. I was like, I feel safe, you know? Um, but yeah, it was messed up. Mm. So he reads the Bible and still yells at you, golly. Mm. Yeah, it was really messed up. He, uh, I mean, he was leading groups, small groups before COVID happened. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, one of my girlfriends who knows him, she, <laughs> like, after all this happened, she was like, honestly, we were really surprised that he was with anyone. He's never been in a relationship. And we talk now. I mean, we pray for him. We pray for him because clearly he does not. I don't think that he knows Jesus. He does not know what true love looks like. And again, I don't say, I, you know, I don't want people to comment on this and say, I hope that guy, you know, don't say bad things about him. He needs Jesus. He needs to learn what love is too. Yeah. There are so many broken people. And I have been a very ugly person in my past when I was broken and I didn't know how to love. Yes. So we just need to hope for the best. So Rebecca, do you know, did he have trauma in his history as well? He grew up with, I believe that, you know, I don't want to say too much about him, but um, from his background, the way that they are brought up is traditionally impersonal, I guess I could say. Um, and yeah, I just don't think he was shown real love. And he would get into it too. He'd be like, you know, my mom never did these things. We didn't say I love you and stuff like that. So I think it has a lot to do with that. So he craved the affection he didn't get as a child, and right. yet he acted in the way that he saw probably his parents mimic with each other towards you. So it was kind of this, yeah. I want, but I see this, and it, it's just this dichotomy yeah. 
made him a narcissist. Yeah, and I think both of us, and I was coming out of that situation with my parents, and I knew what I wanted. I think both there was something in both of us that knew we are coming from twisted situations, but I want this new chance to make it beautiful with this other person. I think that there was something in both of us that felt like we could do that. That's that trauma bonding, you know? It's like maybe we can make something beautiful out of these desires that we have to escape this this past that we're used to, but, um, yeah, it's not a fun game to play. <laughs> no. And I think healing, which is what you've done to yourself. And, and I, again, I adore the human that you are today, um, uh, but it has to take place amongst both parties. Like yeah. you were trying to heal yourself, but he was not ready to heal his hurts. Right. And hopefully he finds that in his life. If he has already, wonderful. If he's working on it or if someday life jars him into getting that work done. And I, I've gone through trauma myself. I was looking over my shoulder for many years after getting out of the house, getting beaten, yelled at and all the everything um, during my teenage years. It's a hard journey if you're not ready to just delve in there deep and work on yourself. Um, yeah. And that emotional energy starts to show up in your physical health, which it did you. And once you removed yourself from that narcissistic relationship, you blossomed. Like everybody's uh, weight and health fell apart during COVID last year. Not Rebecca Farmer. I know. That was the it best year of my life. 100% best year of my life. Yes. For you're sure. the only one who will say 2020 was the best year of your life. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Oh, man. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I have been looking forward to talking to you about this issue. I loved having you on last year. You've become a, a great friend to me, and I really am grateful for all of our banter back and forth through Instagram. Guys, go check her out, Tailored Keto Health, and uh, follow her work. But man, thank you again for opening up. Um, I knew this was going to be amazing today because I adore you, and I think all that you're doing, helping other people now, a lot of your clients, it's not just the physical health. You're talking about some of this stuff too. I, I know it comes yeah. up. And so yeah. thank you for your work in that area. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's always, always, always a pleasure. Thank you for who you are and the messages that you're spreading on your multiple podcasts. I love it. Um, you, you are so gifted in this and I am Still, you know, when we talk on Instagram, it's like, man, Jimmy Moore is one of my best friends. That's pretty awesome. And I really, you are an incredible person. So thank you for having me on here. And I hope that it helps a lot of people. I'm excited. Thank you. Right back at you. <laughs>